Okay, so today's talk is going to focus on hepatitis A. This is an update and a review of the data on the current multi-state outbreak. So we will be reviewing the epidemiology and pathogenesis of hepatitis A infections. Uh, we will be discussing the clinical manifestations and management of these infections. Also looking at strategies for prevention of transmission in a variety of clinical settings. And we're going to review the data on the ongoing uh, multi-state outbreak in the U.S. So let's jump right into it and go to a case. So we have Mrs. X here. She's 34. She's 24 weeks pregnant, and she's hospitalized with hepatitis A infection. She's worried about transmission to her baby. So how would you counsel this patient? Do you just observe and wait for delivery? Because there, and, and you know that there may be rare chronic sequela for the baby from vertical transmission. Do you think she has a high risk of transmission because she's in the second trimester and she should give her immune globulin? Do you think she has a low risk of transmission because she's past that first trimester? Or do you think um, this infection is unlikely to be transmitted vertically? I didn't have clickers today, so think about it and see if you can come up with an answer. Um, give you a couple seconds to let that sink in. Um, I think we are more attuned to hepatitis B infection in pregnancy, and we worry about that, and we screen for that. But I don't think we traditionally think of hepatitis A in pregnancy. We all know the transmission is fecal-oral, so I thought I'd bring this point up. So for, for this case, actually, H, um, hepatitis A infection is unlikely to be transmitted vertically. So now I'm going to walk you through the epidemiology of these infections. Um, so just to go through the memory lane, so since 1947, it was known that there was hepatitis. And they kind of distinguished between two types of hepatitis, the infectious kind, which was the campaign jaundice or epidemic jaundice, and the serum kind. So in 1947, they decided, okay, hepatitis A is going to be the infectious kind, and hepatitis B is going to be the serum kind. Um, however, it was only in 1967 that hepatitis B was actually identified as the agent for that infection, and a vaccine became available in 69. Hepatitis A virus's structure was actually only discovered in 73, and, um, and, that's, and the vaccine was only really FDA approved in the U.S. in 95. So by 96, you had vaccine for high-risk patients recommended, 99 for children in endemic areas. And in 2006 is when this officially became um, incorporated in the routine um, childhood immunization schedule. Um, so humans are the only known reservoir. It's a self-limited illness, and there's really no chronic form. And going back to the question we started with, there is really no maternal-fetal transmission reported. Um, there are several case series out in Taiwan, China, where they looked at moms at various stages of pregnancy that got acute hepatitis A, but they did not transmit to babies. That being said, there's a couple of case reports out there about babies becoming infected in in the early neonatal period, but it wasn't really clear that there was absolutely a vertical transmission because it could have been in the postpartum period. So the answer, that's why the answer to that question was it's unlikely to be transmitted. That's why we don't worry about it and we don't screen about it, screen for it during pregnancy. Again, this is outside the context of our multi-state outbreak. <laughs> Um, so we have about 1.4 million cases per year wo worldwide. In the U.S. in 2016, CDC reported about 2,007 cases. And that year, it was nine cases in Kentucky, which evidently has changed. Um, once the vaccine was introduced, the, the rate of infection decreased by 95%. So that's very significant. Um, and this is what I call my gloom and doom slide. So this is all the hospitalizations, deaths, case fatalities, and mortality. I want you to pay particular attention to the age. So as you get older, your uh, rate of hospitalizations and your rate of death increases dramatically. And I want you to pay attention to those age groups because that is going to come into play when we talk about post-exposure prophylaxis. So you can see here that um, when you're over 70, the rate of hospitalization goes up to anywhere from 42 to 65%. Um, deaths, if you're less than 40, 0.5% risk of death. 
that jumps up if your age is older, and in particular in the older age group. And here you can see that with case fatalities. So about 7% if you're in this age group jumps up to almost 13% if you're older than 70. Okay. So this is the worldwide map of prevalence. Um, any, the darker the green, the higher the prevalence. Um, anything that's gray um, is considered very low prevalence, which again, that has changed <laughs> in the context of our outbreak. But you can see areas of Latin America, like uh, an intermediate um, prevalence, and whereas in Africa, in Southeast Asia, India, you see a high prevalence. This is very important to, to know especially for our travelers going to endemic areas, as you will see later. So let's talk a little bit about transmission and pathogenesis. <clears throat> so we know, we're all familiar that it's fecal-oral transmission. There has been person-to-person -person transmission documented, um, again, from, from contact, um, sharing um, cups, utensils in a family, that's very common. Uh, also, MSM transmission has been documented. And contaminated food or water source, uh, again, is a, a mode of transmission. Now, when we go through the, the further the pathogenesis of hepatitis A, first you have to ingest the virus, right? Then you're going to have replication in the oropharynx and GI tract. Then the virus is transported to the liver where it further replicates. Then it's shed in the bile and transported to the intestines. And then you shed it in the feces. In the feces, actually, very high levels of virus are shed in the stool, much more so than the amount of viremia that you will detect. Then you have viremia, immune response, symptoms, and resolutions. When, uh, when we look at this at a cellular level, if you imagine the hepatocyte here, you're going to have viral replication of your hepatitis A. Then your natural killer cells and your CD8 cells are alerted. They come over there. They're going to destroy your virus. But in the process, there is also going to be destruction of the infected hepatocyte and hepatocellular damage. Interferon gamma has a role in clearing these infected hepatocytes. So the more robust your immune response, um, the more damage you're going to have, the more hepatocellular damage, and the more symptoms you're going to have. Okay, so let's go on to clinical manifestations. Um, and so Mrs. X is asking now how long she was contagious prior to having symptoms of hepatitis A. So your best answer is going to be 3 to 7 days, 7 to 10, 15 to 50 days, or 30 to 60 days. So essentially this is a question about incubation period, right? So anyone want to venture a guess? If you anyone vote for A, just ha quick hands. Nobody. I see shaking heads. Um, what about B? Anybody? Some folks are saying B. What about C? A few folks saying C. Okay. And D? Anybody? No. Nobody for this. So for this one, the actual incubation period is reported as 15 to 50 days. So there was a split there between um, B and C. So let's look into that a little bit more. So when you look at the incubation period, the average is 28 days, but the range is from 15 to 50 days. So the shortest incubation period is felt to be about two weeks. Um, and 70% of adults are going to be symptomatic. When you look at kids, it's the other way around. Uh, and again, this is related to your immune response. Remember I said the more robust the immune response, the more symptomatic you will be. So with kids, it's the other way around, especially very young kids in hyperendemic areas. They get it when they're really young. They don't have any symptoms, have long life immunity. Uh, with adults, it's the other way around. 70% will be symptomatic. Um, so as far as all through your incubation period, through about one week after you, the jaundice appears, you are considered contagious. Mrs. X wanted to know before she had symptoms how long is the incubation period, and that's why that, that was the answer there. Okay. And then, as far as clinical manifestations, we're mostly familiar with them, but you will have an abrupt onset of nausea and vomiting and anorexia and fever and malaise and abdominal pain. In about, in a few days to one week, what you will develop is the classic, you know, dark urine and pale stools. You have jaundice and pruritus. About 40 to 70 percent of folks will have those two, and about 80 percent of folks will have hepatomegaly.
Um, as far as complications, the most fear complication is really fulminant hepatic failure. We know there's no chronic form, but there's a possibility of fulminant hepatic failure. Um, and that is severe liver injury, acute liver injury with encephalopathy and impaired synthetic function, so your INR is going to be prolonged. Um, this happens in less than 1% of patients. It's actually closer to like 0.3%. And as far as risk factors that have been looked at in the literature, age above 50 and Hep B and Hep C co-infections um, may be risk factors for this fulminant hepatic failure. There are some other complications that we think of less, um, but there is a, a, a picture of cholestatic hepatitis, which is basically prolonged jaundice and even pruritus for more than three months. This happens in less than 5% of patients. This will resolve spontaneously, and there's usually no sequela. It's just a more prolonged course of disease. What I found interesting is um, that I wasn't as aware of when, when before doing this talk is this uh, picture of relapsing hepatitis. So there is a possibility that you will have a biphasic peak of disease, where you have the acute disease, you get better, all your markers get better, but then about anywhere within six months, but most commonly within four to seven weeks, you, you almost have a relapse. And you have, again, biochemical markers go up and symptoms come back. Um, it's unclear why folks have this. They think it's just a immune response to continuing antigenic stimuli. Um, and the clinical symptoms tend to last three weeks when, in the relapse phase. And the lab abnormalities can be up to 12 months. It's important to be aware of this because now, especially that we're going to be seeing more hepatitis A, to be aware of this picture of biphasic because it can happen in up to 10% of patients. Um, and you might freak out a little if, if you see that and they're all better and all of a sudden they're worse again. So be aware of this, that this is a possibility. The other um, complication that's been reported is that hep hepatitis A, like many viruses, can be thought of as a trigger for autoimmune hepatitis. So these are patients that have autoimmune hepatitis. They went back and looked, and they had a preceding hepatitis A infection. Again, an association. Um, and this big slide is just for you to have an idea that besides the hep hepatic manifestations, you can have extra hepatic manifestations, and they're varied, multiple case reports here and there. We don't typically think of this when we're dealing with hepatitis A, but even reports of transverse myelitis, the more common reports were of were, were aplastic anemia or thrombocytopenia, and the vasculitis picture, which we also see with hepatitis B, C. Um, I do want to remind you that we lump them all together. Hepatitis A, B, and C are very different beasts, so don't don't think of them as you know super similar because um, the clinical course treatment management is all very different. All right, so let's move on to diagnosis. So the diagnosis is basically going to be ser clinical symptoms and serology. This is just for you to have an idea that. Even before you have symptoms, you start to see your IgM come up here, right? So by the time you're symptomatic, your IgM should be positive, and that's how you make the diagnosis of acute hepatitis A, um, in addition to the clinical picture. Um, you can see IgG starts ramping up here, but truly it comes up by week 12 or so, so three to six months, which is right when IgM is tapering off, okay? And you can also see the duration of viremia, about five weeks, and stool shedding, about that as well. So this is just a quick table about the pattern of um, lab abnormalities. So typically you'll have a AST, um, ALT in the thousands range or more, they peak about a month after exposure and start decreasing by 75% per week. The total billy is, of course, increased, but tends to be 10 or less. In the cases where you have the relapsing picture, that might be higher, and this tends to decrease within two weeks of peak levels. And your ALK FOS is going to be elevated. About 85% of patients are going to recover within two to three months. Nearly 100% of folks are going to be recovered by the six-month mark. So basically, this is what I already said. So clinical picture and serologies, um, your 
IgM should be present um, even before onset of symptoms and stays positive for three to six months. And the IgG is present in the convalescent phase, and it does um, impart lifelong immunity. Of course, as part of the diagnosis, you've got to work up other causes for obstruction and such, so that's in there for them. So what about prevention? When we talk about prevention, um, there are three situations you're going to be um, looking at. So hygienic measures, of course, so we know about hand washing, heating food, so to more than 185 degrees Fahrenheit for at least a minute, try to avoid tap water, raw food, if poor sanitation, and you can use chlorine, bleach, or iodine um, to cleanse uh, surfaces. Um, and that's important in just thinking of when we have imported cases, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation. We always think, okay, we're going to wash the whatever, the fruit or whatever that's imported, and that's great. Please continue to do that. But just washing that off will not get rid of the hepatitis A if it's there. <laughs> okay, so it has to be actually heated, um, heating the food. Um, so that's why there was outbreaks before with frozen fruit and frozen things, and people washed it off, but that wasn't necessarily enough to kill that. The other situation is routine immunization. This is now part of the vaccination schedule, um, and so that is a manner of prevention. And pre-exposure prophylaxis, which you're going to come across when you, prior to travel to endemic areas. So those are the three situations that we talk about um, prevention. So for prevention, you have a couple of options. You have active immunization with the vaccine, as you're familiar with, and passive immunization with immune globulin. So active immunization is evidently preferred for prevention because it gives you lifelong immunity, right? And you're going to use your immune globulin in special situations when you can't use your vaccine, all right? These are the list of indications for hepatitis A routine immunization. So now all children at age one year, so anywhere from 12 to 23 months, they get vaccinated. They can catch up later. That's fine. Any travelers to countries that have high rates of hepatitis A, if you, have, if you have an adopted child or family member and you're a caregiver and that adoptee is from a hepatitis A endemic area, men who have sex with men, uses of illicit substances, and I do want to emphasize this is, includes injection and non-injection. It's not just IV drug use because, remember, if you're sharing a joint, you know, you're, you have the, the manner of transmission. So... Keep that in mind. So people with chronic liver disease, including hepatitis B and C, any, they already have baseline liver issues. You want to avoid topping that off with hepatitis A. Um, anyone who's treated with clotting factor concentrate, because remember, those are pooled uh, blood um, sources from multiple patients, so that's a risk factor. Of course, this is all screened for um, here in the U.S., and then people that are working in a research lab that deals with hepatitis A. The ACIP actually says any person wishing to be vaccinated should get immunized. That does not necessarily translate into coverage by insurance companies. So <laughs> call your insurance first, um, but that's what the ACIP says. So that's routine immunization. When we look at the special situations where you can't use your vaccine, that's when that immune globulin is going to come in play for pre-exposure protection. So, and we will go into this in detail. I will explain why the cutoff of 40 years, but individuals more than 40 years, um, immunocompromised individuals that are unable to respond to the vaccine, if you already have chronic liver disease, chronic medical conditions, you're traveling and you aren't able to get the two full doses, if you're allergic to hepatitis A vaccine, or if you're less than 12 months of age and you're going to travel to an endemic area. And you can give, in this situation here, if they don't have enough time for the second shot, you can give the vaccine on one site and the immune globulin for pre-exposure protection at a different site, okay? So what products are available for routine immunization and pre-exposure prophylaxis? So routine immunizations, there are three products available. Most of us are familiar with these. Um, the two uh, hepatitis A alone vaccines are inactivated. Both of these have adult and pediatric dosing, and you need two doses of vaccine. The schedule is at zero 
to six to 18 months. Of course, you can go later than this if you and catch up. You don't have to start the series over. <laughs> Um, Twin Rigs is a combination product with Hep A and B. It's inactivated. There's only an adult dose, and this requires three um, shots. Um, and this is partly because the dose of antigen in the Hep A is half of the other products. The immune globulin, there is one product licensed here in the States, and that's the Gamma Stan. This is not specific to hepatitis A. It has antibodies to measles, rubella, and varicella as well. Um, the dosing varies. So we're talking about pre-exposure prophylaxis here. So if you're anticipating about a month of exposure, you're going to do 0.1 mLs per kilo. If you're anticipating two months of exposure, the dose is higher. If you're going to stay there for more than two months, you have to find somewhere over there that's going to give you another shot. So um, that's one of the limitations of this. But those are the products available. Now let's talk about efficacy. How good is this vaccine? And how good is the immune globulin? So for healthy folks, 95% immunity after one dose and close to 100% immunity after two doses. The problem is that this immunity can vary in age groups. So the older you are, you might have a different immune response. So if you're older than 40 and specifically older than 60 going to older than 70, there's a, a lot of variation in the literature as far as the response, um, but the range can be anywhere from 60 to 69% with one dose. But most of these folks, when they get the second dose, they go to 100% immunity. And you get an antibody response in about two weeks after vaccine. In some cases, I've even read even 10 days, you can already have a response to this vaccine. What about the immune globulin for pre-exposure? So there, there's a 90% decrease of incidence of hep A infection if you use the immune globulin, if you have to use it. So this works, but it has some limitations. So that's how good the vaccine and the immune globulin are for prevention, right? So now that we've talked about prevention, let's talk a little bit about management, which I feel is where we, we're going to have a lot of questions um, with the current outbreak. So management, you're going to think of two situations, active infection or post-exposure prophylaxis. Those are the two main things. So for active infection, is there anything out there to treat hepatitis A for an active infection? So the short answer is no. Um, they have looked at multiple different compounds and drugs. Um, this virus is in the, in the same family as enteroviruses, so they tried to look at some compounds that worked for enterovirus. They weren't very success, successful, sorry. Um, they have looked at sofosbuvir, which is for hep C. There was a recent article just this earlier this year, um, basic science article, it does not seem to inhibit replication in non-hepatic cell lines. So it does inhibit hep A, but a lot of further studies need, are needed. So right now, it's just supportive care. They have looked into it, haven't found anything particularly helpful for um, an acute active infection. What about post-exposure prophylaxis? So again, you have two options. You have the option of active immunization with the vaccine or passive immunization with the immune globulin. The products available are the same. You will notice I removed the combined uh, Hep A, Hep B um, vaccine here just because the amount of antigen for Hep A is, is lower. So you do not want to use it in a post-exposure situation, okay, because you want the highest amount of antigen there. Um, and, of course, the immune globulin. Now, again, in a post-exposure situation, if you have had at least one dose of Hep A vaccine given about a month prior to exposure, this may not be necessary. So let's talk a little bit about post-exposure prophylaxis. This is very interesting. So until 2006 in the U.S., the only th thing that you used for post-exposure prophylaxis was the immune globulin. That makes sense, right? You, you had an exposure. You need those antibodies now. You're going to give immune globulin, right? That makes sense. They looked at that. Is, does it work? Yes, it works. It reduces your risk by, again, 90%. But there's some issues with immune globulin, cost, availability, side effects. And, and so people started thinking, okay, if the vaccine we know is good and you get good response within 10 to 14 days, can we use the vaccine in a post-exposure situation, right? 
So they looked at that in a few studies, and they're like, yeah, this does work. Uh, it does decrease the incidence of infection. But there were no head-to-head -head studies between immune globulin and vaccine. So that was the problem for a long time, until this landmark study that came out in 2007. So this was a head-to-head -head study looking at vaccine versus immune globulin for post-exposure prophylaxis and hepatitis A. So this was a study that was actually done in Kazakhstan, and this is an area with intermediate uh, hep A endemicity. They looked at about 1,900 patients that were close contacts of a confirmed hepatitis A case. The age group included, though, was only 2 to 40 years old in this study. They randomized the patients to each group. All of them received the intervention for each arm within 10 days of exposure. And they saw that the vaccine arm, there was 86% protection from getting the infection and in the immune globulin, 90%. So it was proven to be non-inferior. Problem with that is that they only looked at those age groups. And you remember my gloom and doom slide, right? The older you get, the less predictable your response to the, va to the vaccine. So this study re is what the change in the guidelines was based on. Before, only immune globulin for everybody. Problem with access, with costs, with side effects. Now, with this study, they're like, okay, we can use the vaccine for post-exposure prophylaxis also, but in select cases. So let's go into some more questions to look into what we do in post-exposure cases. Okay, so we're back to Mrs. X. Mrs. X has given us a lot of questions. So she's about to be discharged from the hospital, right? And she's asking if she, what do we do, what do I do with our family members? You know, I have, I live with my husband, my one-year-old son, and I couldn't go to his one-year appointment because I was in the hospital. So that's just to give you a clue that the kid didn't probably get his hep A shot, right? So what are your recommendations? I made this kind of simple, but do you do post-exposure prophylaxis for all unvaccinated household members, or you watch them and do nothing until they develop symptoms? So any votes for A? Okay. Any votes for B? Not so much. Okay, good. So this, this is really post-exposure prophylaxis for all previously unvaccinated household members. So if you have a close personal contact of a confirmed infection, and by that we mean a household contact, sexual contact, or sharing illicit drugs, and again, this is both injection and non-injection, right? If no previous vaccine, they need post-exposure protection. Okay, so... Mrs. X has a couple more questions. So she, you're giving her to her discharge paper. She's ready to go. Then she gets a call from her husband. He's like, you know, I wasn't feeling well. I started to go yellow. I went to my doctor yesterday. They diagnosed me with hepatitis A also. As she's getting this call, she's getting a text from her daycare center, right? They're like, is your son coming tomorrow and he's out of diapers? And that's significant. We will see why. How do you counsel this patient? So now you have two household contacts with the child, right? So the son needs post-exposure prophylaxis, assuming he didn't get the vaccine, right, because they missed the appointment, but not any of his classmates. Her son, his classmates, and room teacher need post-exposure prophylaxis, but no one else. Or all previously unvaccinated daycare staff and attendees need post-exposure prophylaxis. So any votes for A? No. What about B? No. <laughs> what about C? Okay. All right. So that is correct. So basically here, the, the significance of the daycare center having diapers or not is because your contact with stool is going to be great, right? So that makes logical sense. So the recommendation is if you have a daycare center that does have kids with diapers, and you have one case or more in a kid or staff, or you have two household cases in the family, which is this case, then you are going to have to, if for all un unvaccinated staff and attendees, you have to give post-exposure protection. What about for the daycare centers that don't have kids with diapers? So the, the case count is the same, 
But in that case, it'll be the classroom contacts only because you're, you're limited exposure to stool, which is where you would transmit, okay? All right. So now you're finally trying to get her out the door, you counsel. And I want to add here that a lot of this is hypothetical. In a hospital situation, your infection prevention team is on board, your hospital epidemiologist is on board. There, you know, you're going to have your answers, but this is for purposes of education. So you casually ask as she's going out the door, what does your husband do? So he's like, oh, he's a restaurant worker. What's the best next best step now? So you ensure the health department is notified, which again, your infection prevention team in real life would have hopefully done that. And all the other food handlers need post-exposure prophylaxis, if non-immune. No further action, because the husband's not your patient. That's not your problem. <laughs> or all non-immune restaurant food handlers and patrons in contact with the husband over the last two weeks need post-exposure prophylaxis. Any votes for A? OK. <laughs> what about B? Nobody picked B, right? What about C? Some votes for C. OK. So the answer for this one is A. OK. So let's talk about uh, restaurant workers. So um, I know I have Dr. Kaloya here from the health department um, working a lot with this uh, in this outbreak. Um, so for food handlers, uh, the risk here is twofold. Um, one, mostly because of the contact with the food, but also food handlers may have additional risk factors um, that put them at risk for hepatitis A. But in this situation, the recommendation is that all the other food handlers at the same establishment should have post-exposure protection. How about tracking down all the patrons, right? Because that's your worry, right? You wait there and you got the notification, you saw in the news, the restaurant A has a worker with hepatitis A, and you're like, oh my gosh, I ate there last night. What do I do? So it's not really recommended uh, as far as tracking down every single patron unless the, the, the food handler actually had explosive diarrhea. They were, they were like seriously contaminating something because you have to look at attack rate, right? Um, so the likelihood of transmission from a casual contact like that will be lower. It's different in a household contact, okay? Again, that being said, this is all outside of the context of a big outbreak. We have to be flexible in and take a case-by-case -case basis when we're making these judgment calls. At the end of the day, the guidelines are there to guide you, but ultimately you have to make a clinical judgment and figure that out. But that's the recommendation. Typically, you don't go after trying to track down every single patron. However, you will get those calls because people are going to be worried and they're going to be called. Okay, so now that we know which groups need the post-exposure prophylaxis, how do we do the post-exposure prophylaxis? So if you have um, the, it has to be done within two weeks because that, that's when it works best, two weeks, within, within two weeks of exposure. The earlier, the better, okay? Even the one-week mark is really good. So again, I'm going back to the gloom and doom slide and the 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 discussion about why vaccine can now be used for uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, right? So if you have uh, somebody who's healthy, 12 months to 40 years of age, you prefer to give the vaccine because we know that in this group, they will respond well to the vaccine, okay? If you have an old, and I'm, I take offense to this older definition here, over 41, but anyway. So if you're older, um, the, in that age group, remember, that was not in the study. So we don't know how well this group does on just vaccine. So that is why it's, the recommendation is to use immune globulin if available. If not, go ahead and use the vaccine, of course. And of course, special situations, immunocompromised, if you're younger than one year old, if you have chronic liver disease or you're allergic to the vaccine, then those are the special situations when you use immune globulin, okay? So hopefully that every, everyone's clear on why the age cutoffs and why, you know, why we do this this way. All right, now let's go to the interesting part of the talk, which is um, all about the outbreaks, okay? So there's, these are the main risk groups for outbreaks for hepatitis A. So on, in, on this end here, you have community outbreaks, um, mostly endemic areas if you have a, a common contaminated food or water source. 
Um, on this end here, I've put the international outbreaks, and that's importing food that's contaminated, okay? So we've had these here in the States. And then you have healthcare setting outbreaks and special groups, homeless and illicit drug use outbreaks, okay? So let's talk about the imported food outbreaks. So the recent ones that we've had, we've had in 2013, we had imported pomegranate seeds from Turkey. It was in an antioxidant blend, and it affected 10 U.S. states with 162 cases, about half hospitalized and no deaths. We also had raw scallops from Philippines, and this was in Hawaii um, in sushi rest, in a chain of sushi restaurants. And here you have nearly 300 cases, 74 hospitalizations, and no deaths. And then you had frozen strawberries also in 2016, and these were imported from Egypt. This went across nine U.S. states, and you had 143 cases, no deaths, about half hospitalized, a little less. Um, I do want to say that all these products have, are now okay, too, so you don't freak out that you had the smoothie from wherever. Um, so that was the food outbreaks. Let's talk a little bit about healthcare workers, okay? That's the next group that we um, alluded to. So you start thinking about Mrs. X, and he's like, wow, this case is really complex. Lots of questions here. So which healthcare workers need post-exposure prophylaxis? Everyone um, with direct contact, all healthcare workers with direct contact with Mrs. X that haven't had the vaccine. If Mrs. X is the only existing case of hepatitis, no post exposure prophylaxis is really indicated. All previous unvaccinated healthcare workers on the floor during her stay, or all, all healthcare workers that were in the inpatient service at all during that stay. So this is a tricky question, So, but w what do you guys think? A, all direct contact, who votes for A? B, if she's the only existing case, maybe it's not indicated. Some people shaking their heads. Um, all previously unvaccinated healthcare workers on the floor, some votes for that. Every, every healthcare worker that was inpatient. <laughs> yeah, no, all right, okay, good. So um, I had questions, too, about this question, which is why I brought it up. Um, if you look at the guidelines, um, the, the answer is this. I kind of wanted to do A, and that's where I say that the guidelines are there to guide you. At the end of the day, you have to make a clinical judgment, because if your healthcare worker that was in contact with Mrs. X and is like, oh, she had a bout of explosive diarrhea, I was in there cleaning everything up, I don't know if I got my hep A vaccine, would you really be like, eh, there's only one case, it's okay, you're good, you know? So at the end of the day, yes, the guidelines are there, but you make your, you make your clinical judgment in conjunction with your friendly infection prevention team and your friendly hospital epidemiologist, right? Okay, so that's what the, so let's look into what groups are associated with healthcare associated um, outbreaks. So one is an, is usually infected kids, incontinent of stool, and folks did not adhere to the infection control measures. There was a breakdown in that. Foodborne, there was something contaminated either in the hospital cafeteria or they were sharing food on the wards or in the break rooms. That's been described as a source of outbreaks in the healthcare setting. Invasive procedure, either um, cholecystectomy or EGD, and the equipment was contaminated from the previous patient, so that's happened. Um, patients of low socioeconomic status or with addiction, um, that is happening now. Um, and also infusion of hepatitis A contaminated blood products, that, um, and that mostly in children who are getting infusions uh, of some sort. So those are the big groups that have been described in the literature. And what about how, uh, how well immune are our healthcare workers to hepatitis A? So when we looked at that, it's, a, it's so varied, um, and it depends on where you're from. So there was this study here that kind of tried to compile worldwide studies on this issue. So the, in healthcare workers that were just grouped as healthcare workers, the, it varied from 32% immunity to Hep A to 78% in Brazil. Um, other compilations with physicians, 37 to 
nurses and paramedics, very low percentage in Germany and higher in other countries. And cleaning staff was looked at too because there are outbreaks reported in cleaning staff. So folks who are taking the sheets and the bedclothes to get clean. Um, so that, that uh, has been reported too. So it's variable. And here in the U.S., it's very hard to predict that. It really depends on where you're from. And if you got your Hep A vaccine, were you young enough um, to get it? So the attack rate reported for nursing staff is 15 to 27 percent in this compilation of studies, and for physicians, about 3 to 4 percent. So that's like your attack rate. Um, all right. So if you have, a, again, these are the guidelines. We already went through them, but use your clinical judgment. If it's a single case and the source of inspections outside the work or school setting, by guidelines, it's not indicated. If it's going around, now you have one case in healthcare workers and it, you having more cases, then it's indicated. Okay, so now let's get to our multi-state outbreak. So what do you guys think is the most likely risk factor that has been identified in this recent multi-state outbreak? Is it a common contaminated water source, illicit substance use and or homelessness, or common contaminated food source? Who votes for A? I see some votes for A. What about B? Lots of votes for B. And C? A couple votes for C. Okay. So it, this current outbreak, that is the the main um, identified risk factor. So let's talk about these state outbreaks. So right now, these are the states um, that have it. Michigan started back in August of 2016. There are 80, 821 cases. You can see 80% hospitalized and about 3% deaths. Utah was the next one. You can see the amount of cases, um, amount hospitalized and deaths. California, you can see the amount of cases and deaths. Kentucky, this is where we were last. Um, and this is sort of the rate of hospitalizations and this is the amount of deaths. Indiana just um, kind of started out at the same time, but less cases here. The only state where this seems to be letting up is California um, so far. All the other states are still um, having a lot of cases. So. so let's look at our distribution here. So as you can see, this is us, and we have the most number. And actually, this number has been updated to 327 now um, as of a couple days ago. But um, that's where we're at. Um, and let's look at the age distribution. So you can see these are the age groups that are mostly affected, and these are all from the health department report that's online. Um, these are the risk factors for Kentucky, and as you, most of you correctly pointed out, you know, the illicit drug use, again, is the majority, and the combination, if you do the combined here, that's the majority. Um, some MSM, some no risk factors, and unknown risk is where you weren't able to contact the health department or um, prevention wasn't able to contact the patients to figure out what the risk factor was. So here in Jefferson County, that's our breakdown, roughly. So you can see illicit drug use is really the predominant one. Um, and when you, this was a very interesting slide, also from the, uh, the health department website. So if you look at the little green dots, those are the syringe exchange programs. Uh, the blue lines are the major interstates, and the gray are the counties with cases. So you can see the major interstates, the exchange program, and right there, there's all the clusters of cases. So that's very interesting to look at. This is another map that Dr. Colloy actually gave me. Um, so this, these are all the cases, and these actually mirror the arrest maps for drug-related offenses. So that's very telling as far as uh, where this is coming from. Okay, Th these, this is kind of the map of the outbreak. Um, the outbreak was officially declared, I believe, in November. We had some cases before, but you see March and you see April, we're kind of topping that, so it's ongoing. Um, and so what can, what are the community prevention efforts, right? So basically right now the focus is on vaccines, 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 right? So this, this takes a lot of effort from the public health department to coordinate all these community partnerships, right? Because 
specific partners are going to focus on specific groups. Right now, the health department is focusing on some of those folks who have limited resources as far as giving them vaccines. So they are pairing up with all these community partners. So at the Department of Corrections, more than 4,200 vaccines <coughs> given. The UFL uh, outpatient pharmacies are uh, here, the ICB, focusing on healthcare workers, EMS, fire departments, if you're a provider for homeless, um, so they've given this many vaccines, 1,900. Uh, our vaccine clinic, so Dr. Ruth Carrico um, is heading that effort, is focusing on food service work workers, more than 5,000 vaccines given at this point in time. And if you count all the sites, um, more than uh, close to 27, getting close to 30,000 vaccines given at this point in time. Um, as far as focusing on our clinic, so that's our little van uh, for the ID van. Uh, we also do outreach besides um, the clinic. So these are some of the places we've gone to. So local restaurants, downtown hotels, so 4th Street Live retail complexes. We've done a lot of work um, just going to them. You can't come to us, we'll go to you. So definitely... Um, something that we've been doing um, in conjunction with the health department. This is a, a link, um, which would be very important for you. And there's a couple of handouts I've printed on the way out. And this is where can I get my hepatitis A vaccine? Because you're going to be getting calls from folks. And this link really details if you have insurance per age, if you don't have insurance. But the, mo the takeaway point is there's no shortage of vaccine and have your patient call their insurance because sometimes the insurance will approve a vaccine being given in an office setting but not in a pharmacy setting. So you have to just make that call, okay? And this is the summary. So this is a preventable disease, high vaccine efficacy. There's no specific antiviral for treatment. You need to understand the indications for post-exposure prophylaxis and work with your team of infection prevention, health department, and hospital epidemiology. Controlling an outbreak calls for a very, very coordinated effort between public health authorities and all the community partners, and there is no current shortage of vaccine. So that's all I had for you today, um, and I'll open it to questions. Thank you. That was great. It was uh, informative and entertaining both, and as you can see, it really excited, you know, quite a bit of interest. So I see an immediate question. Uh, so I have a lot of patients who are calling me. Mm -hmm. Because they are on uh, biologic uh, therapy or methotrexin, and they want to know is it safe for them to be vaccinated? So, yes. two questions. Mm -hmm. Why is it safe? Mm -hmm. It's an inactivated vaccine, so it's not a live virus, so I believe it's safe. Mm -hmm. But uh, two, is it effective? Because those are patients whose uh, immune system has been uh, immune modulated. Right. So um, the questions were, can patients on biologics get hepatitis, get hepatitis A vaccine safely, and what is the efficacy in that population? So the first question you already answered, and yes, it is safe because it's inactivated, um, as we would imagine. As far as the efficacy in that population, um, there's not a whole lot of data. I do know for HIV-positive patients, another immunocompromised group, their rate of response is tends to be lower between, again, very 60 to 85 percent in some um, cases. So the answer is we don't know, but it doesn't hurt to get it. So, so um, the question is, people who have had the vaccine in the remote past, and by that, do you mean the full, they, they got the full series, the two-dose series, or just, yes. So the recommendation is that if you've been vaccinated in the past with a two-dose series, you are considered, considered to have lifelong protection. So that is the, the, the recommendation. Yes. yes. My yes. comment and question. Uh, my, my comment is, this is a public health issue. Why should individuals have to pay for it? it seems to me this is another better uh, basis for a national health system. The second is, what is what's the source of the of problem? There's some of us that are old enough to have lot whole new diseases that get discovered because of human product being given, even in thinking that is a human albumin. Where, where does the IP come from? So from and correct me if I'm wrong, Lori, um, this is pooled from donors. So, yes. Absolutely free of risk of transmission of any known. 
<laughs> which is why they made the push to look into vaccine for post-exposure because there was that risk. That is correct. And uh, as far as to your first question, uh, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> Sorry. Say from a public health perspective, I wish we had more money. If we had all the money in the world, we wouldn't have to rely on insurance. Yeah. Um, I myself, you know, I do see the benefit of a, a national health system. I don't know that that's ever going to happen in our country. I would love for it to, because then we would all have access to the vaccines, and this would not be an outbreak that's occurring right now. But um, yeah, I, so we appreciate the help of all the community providers <coughs> getting their patients vaccinated. Um, we have limited resources, which is why we've had to focus our main efforts on those high-risk groups. So. Um, any person who wants to get vaccine that has the means outside of the public health funding, um, it is ideal for them to be able to do that. So thank you all for what you're already doing. Yes. Is there any uh, historical perspective on this type of outbreak? Is maybe quite the opposite to this. It, it seems like if you're not homeless or not a drug user, maybe this is a little bit of a hysteria. It seems like the sides are almost all the cases that are homeless and concentrated on that population, our patients falling, you should say if you're not homeless or an IV drug user, it's really fairly low risk, or is this historically, it starts there, and then the entire population so if I look at the experience from California, which is the only state where it's starting to slow down, they did do massive immunization. Like they gave more than 123,000 vaccines. So I think, um, I think the problem is because our vaccine recommendations changed later, and we were not considered uh, intermediate or high endemicity, our immunity out in the community is not great. So if you have an outbreak risk, and as healthcare workers, we're going to see this more, you know, if you don't know for healthcare workers. As far as the larger population, you don't know who you're going to come in contact with or who. So I think... From ACIP stand, standpoint, it's recommended to get immunized for Hep A. But you're right. If, if there is some of the hysteria that, oh my gosh, I, I ate it wherever, or I'm going to get it from wherever. Yes, they might not be the risk group now, and that's true. But you you don't know how far this is going to go. So, yes. Uh, do you know what the vaccine cost if they choose to the That's a. Uh, also a wide net of variability. Yeah. <laughs> Lori's, yeah. The source of, by which you're getting the vaccine, for example, if public health funding sources are less expensive than if you were to purchase the vaccine as a private provider. So that's variable across the board. Yeah. Some of the um, pharmacies are charging over $100 for the vaccine. Yeah. Yes, ma'am? people aware of this. One difficulty we've been facing with vaccination is like sweet fruit kind of at least my son has done a lot of work on this, but uh, we've had considerable pushback from the third party payers saying that uh, vaccination is a primary care issue, we're not going to cover it at the specialist orders of for example, by the patient come the other day and said uh, I saw primary care yesterday, I knew I was coming to a pathologist. Go to the and get a FA vaccine. Well, I can't get a FA vaccine. In fact, we're getting rid of it and we pretend we have money loss, I'm told, because we're not getting here first. So there's like all the primary care is a medical way. Especially us, I don't know why it should matter, but it does. We just haven't come to yeah. it. Even in our own special tax. So I have a question. Oh, she's sorry, she's um, uh, from the slides. Uh, I understand that if uh, vaccinating more healthcare workers, or more food, food uh, related mm -hmm. to uh, the workers related to food, than the homeless, uh, is mm -hmm. a drug use as well. Uh, but they are mm -hmm. at the risk of constant, uh, contracting the disease. Mm -hmm. So are we disproportionately vaccinated? The the problem with the so you, you your question was why are we focusing on food service workers? Is that your question? Well, we're not really only focusing on food service workers. Um, you know, that's one of the groups that the community partners are working with. The health department is certainly focusing on the main groups. The problem is access to those groups. You know, if the the homeless and illicit drug users, they might be a little harder to 
get a hold of, you know. So, but it's, if the slides were portrayed that way or interpreted that way, that is not the case. Um, that is one of the community partnership is food workers. Then there's all these other groups that are being targeted, including the main groups. Um, yes. I had a question, I had a question about food supply. Oh, Chris? Uh, yes. How does our death rate compared to the California death rate? The, the, the most disturbing slide was most people would have to have to get better. Is it because the current outbreak is in co infected people and that's why the death rate is high, or is there something else? So there is a high rate of co-infection with Hep B and C. Unfortunately, I don't have the exact numbers in our outbreak. That is correct. Um, and when you look at the death rate, um, it is what would be expected with hepatitis A in general, I would say. But definitely the co-infected, we know that they're going to do worse. So, uh, But that is definitely a factor in there. Yeah, we've looked at that. Um, our co-infection rate, um, the last time we had calculated those numbers was about three-quarters of the patients that we were seeing were co-infected mm -hmm. with either A, B, or sorry, with either B, B or C. Both. Um, I think that's slightly lower than some of the other areas. Uh, California's outbreak had a higher percentage of homeless compared to drug use. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know their age range to know if that's, you know, that mm -hmm. was slightly higher compared to our outbreak. And I would say, you know, perhaps it has something to do with our fabulous medical care here in Louisville that we are having such a great, uh, mm -hmm. a low death rate. So thank you all for um, taking care of these patients and doing such a wonderful job. So I was going to ask, so if, if you go to the grocery store, mm -hmm. fruits, fruits and vegetables are from all over the world now. Mm -hmm. And I don't usually heat up my peaches to 185 degrees. <laughs> So, so, I mean, how um, how are we assured that the food sources are free of mm -hmm. hepatitis A? We're just not. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> we're just not. So for us, really, the best solution is make sure you're up to date with your vaccine. Then you can eat whatever. You eat. <laughs> you, okay. you don't need to. You don't need to heat up your peaches. But <laughs> on the public health standpoint, we get a ton of questions from the community about this. Why are we releasing media releases about all of these facilities? For us, it's about we need to know if people are are getting, getting sick. Yeah. These sources, mm -hmm. the risk is incredibly low in these sorts of outbreaks, um, but it's not zero. We can't tell people there's no risk, and if they don't know that they've been potentially exposed, they won't realize mm -hmm. that there was a potential contact, and that might help us with preventing further spread of the hepatitis A from a public health perspective. You know, am I changing my eating or health, uh, or grocery mm. shopping practices based on this outbreak? No, but I have also been vaccinated. So, um, <laughs> you know, from a, from a self-prevention um, perspective, you know, that's why we're encouraging with the ASAP recommendation. If people want to get vaccinated, by all means, that gives them a peace of mind. As far as the food service focus, um, according to the state, there's approximately 70% of the food service workers fall into one of our high-risk categories. So if you think about that, many people may end up, um, after leaving their incarceration time for their drug arrest, working in a food um, service industry. And so we have focused on that group to try to um, additionally reach those high-risk uh, groups in this outbreak. So there's definitely a rhyme to our reason with the food industry, and not because we're fearful necessarily of them spreading the illness, but more so this is an opportunity for us to reach those high-risk populations in a more unique uh, venue. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.